The formation and early musical development of Test Department from 1981 onwards cannot be separated from the political, social and economic landscape of London at that time, which acted as both a resource and cultural amplifier for the group. It arose as an idealistic scream of anger, emerging from the firebrand energy of punk, its nerf endings exposed, emanating a raw sense of unfinished business. It was born out of the crumbling in the cities and economically decimated ghost towns of Britain, where the desolate boarded up high streets resembled the array of riot shields that first appeared in South London during the Brixton riots in 1981, known locally as the Uprising. Margaret Thatcher's election in 1979 had been the catalyst for the introduction of Reaganomics, opening the floodgates to an untrammeled free market. It heralded a rampant ideological drive which had little concern for any human consequences as a result of its implementation. Thatcher herself proudly stated there was no such thing as society, polarising the population into hardened positions that offered no opportunity for consensus or compromise. Such moments developing were to become the key cultural signifiers in the forming social psyches of the fledgling test department. An ex-industrial site is supposed to be mute. It should know its place in the symbolic order of sedative post-imperial heritage the test steps have always confronted. It should be picturesque, but not intrusive. It may retain a degree of eeriness, but this should not spill over or become active. One of the problems affecting much so-called hauntological culture is precisely its coziness even when applied to dark pasts. In short, too often, hauntology isn't haunting, or rather, is only safely and meekly haunting. However, a reoccupied, illuminated and amplified ruin, visible and audible at some distance, is more alarming. DS-30 was a rebuke to the cultural stasis and retrospection that Fisher diagnosed. The video featured hundreds of cold witnesses to the battles of the 1980s and how these haunt the present. Rather than burying them, it brought them back to life. The sequence in which archive photos of mining sites gradually fade into the post-industrial landscapes is a good example of this. Viewed alone, this could seem like an apolitical, hauntological fetishization, or even a celebration of the disappearance of heavy industry regardless of human cost. Yet because of the conceptual aesthetic force and rigour of the whole, it avoids these traps. The film and the site were certainly suffused with mourning, but also with anger. Tastep's militantly modernist melancholy leaves space for grief and the tragic, but also strives to avoid being captured by them. Rather than simply aestheticizing ruins, they agitate and galvanize them. Not ruin porn, but ruin prop, which transforms sites of inaction to sites of action. Here, 
like the historical Russian avant-garde. They suggested how art and action can be united, without diluting the power of either. The proliferation of squats and thriving housing cooperatives in South London encouraged a disparate group of the socially disaffected and mostly unemployed to set up base in New Cross. Here they integrated with local students from Goldsmiths College, completing Test Step's first membership. This enabled free access to multimedia resources and created a burgeoning support network and fan base. It was also here, at the edge of the decaying docklands along the Thames, that Test Step first uncovered its creative inspiration. Their rough excavations tapped into a latent energy, releasing an increasingly relentless sonic battery, which years later became the driving force behind the expansive multidisciplinary collective titled the Ministry of Power. The regenerators of bust and boom undertook pitiless gentrification programs on the edges of the industrial hinterlands driving out established populations while grasping new fortunes into the bargain. Simultaneously, Test Stepped as self-styled recyclers looked to sift and reconstruct the debris. New sound possibilities were sculpted, creating a living instrument of change, a sonic war machine wired into the unrest of the times. In Deptford's Creekside, bordering the ancient base of maritime Greenwich, lay the residue of the glorious imperial past, rusting hunks of industrial machinery, shimmering in the heat of spring sunshine. Amidst the towering cranes and mechanical claws sweeping through the mountains of metal, the group swarmed and scavenged among the detritus, inspecting and testing the resonant sonic qualities of the waste products of a declining industrial era. Ruin and dereliction are also a form of official history. Allowing a site to rot is a slow motion form of historical erasure. A site like Beckton Gasworks was a decaying monument to the labour of those who had worked there, and also to those killed in wartime bombing. Yet closure can silence such personal and collective histories, as well as the actual sounds of labour and machinery. Forty years ago the group began to challenge this process in real time, learning how to occupy and to play ex-industrial spaces, how to utilise the acoustic properties of concrete, steel, iron, and eventually increasingly vast buildings. As fast as monasterism shut down sites, they scavenged and began to plan how to reanimate them. The debris lying around could be honed and forged into defiant new uses, as could the buildings themselves. Testap represents a mode of corrective cultural force, and one of the strongest expressions of this was the conscription of ruins and former industrial spaces as sites of corrective memory. This mode of memorialization is rigorous rather than resigned, and fights rather than celebrates the erasure of memory. Their interventions in such spaces challenge the narratives that declare when a space and its workers are useful and useless. The temporary artistic reoccupation and reanimation of increasingly vast spaces whether still used in a ruined state or scheduled for destruction, can spur audiences to remember not just the specific histories of a building, but its wider physical and sonic environment, enriching the space and the memory of the space. Forty years on, who will control the coming wave of ruins to be? 
that the crisis will create, and who will make them resonate, and how.
miners. Now they've come from the NUM. Now they've come from the trade union movement. You've got to get off your ass to help us. Through this strike, there's been a lot of poetry. This is my one and only poem. Justice for the miners, down with the police state. Victory to the miners, victory to all working people in struggle throughout the world. When the collective is invoked, many are alarmed. They consider what they might lose individually, rather than going collectively. From the outside, the facade of Testup's militant collectivism can seem daunting. In many ways this was necessary. Much of its impact derived from having a fearsomely regimented image, which succeeded all too well in intimidating state authorities, as the surveillance they were subjected to revealed. The image of Testap's total machine wasn't a romanticised form of the collective, but a forcefully functional and efficient one, especially as it clashed so vigorously with the privatising ethos of the time. In 1981, very few people imagined the levels of personalised commodification we see in the Instagram to Big Brother era, when we've all become products, and the unspoken command is to constantly reveal as much of yourself as possible. Their collectivism was a rebuke in advance to the Americanized selfie culture we're now consumed by. Perhaps we can draw inspiration from the refusal to share or to perform degrading emotional labor for corporations or social media audiences. Yes, their work is not emotionless or heartless, nor do they refuse all emotional labor. Instead, they focus productive emotions, anger, resolve, and militant melancholy. The collective was also always more flexible than it may seem, allowing for tactical alliances and productive meetings of minds, rather than demanding the total orthodoxy that their image once suggested. There are a few directly personal stories in the work, 
and Total State Machine was a rare example of the group speaking openly of their own biographies. While these definitely played into the group's work, they never became the subject of the work itself. By processing and depersonalising emotions, they make them more collectively resonant. In 2021, they remain dissidents, subverting the emotional economy through collective resolve, setting out a model of focused effective labour that refuses conscription into shallowness. In the 80s, they wielded the spectre of the utopian collective, not just against the predatory Thatcherite state, but in the dysfunctional contexts of so-called actually existing socialism. It may be that their Eastern Bloc experiences of clandestine performances, militarised border crossings and police harassment are going to become very grimly relevant as we experience the accelerating failures of actually existing imperialist revivalism in England. We may face shortages of goods and compassion, but we will not face shortages of historical parallels and useful lessons from the past. One of the ironies of the European network tour 1985, which went through East and West Europe, was that regardless of the colour of the local political system, there was exactly the same higher level of police interest. We were trailed, documented and harassed in every country that we went into. It was like being in a strange state of siege. We were in a 1960s hand-painted sedan coach carrying a tonne and a half of scrap metal in the back bunch of shaved heads and flat tops in the front, so perhaps we did look a bit unusual. That level of attraction began to break down some of the ideas that the West represented total freedom and the East is all repression. The state apparatus is used to survey and keep a very close eye on whoever was deemed the enemy within. We didn't even attempt to play in East Germany, which was deeply repressive, and in Czechoslovakia the concert organisers could have easily ended up spending a couple of years in prison. It was a very paranoid time and shows how brave the people were who tried to make things happen. They were taking a lot of personal risks. In Hungary the authorities did try and intimidate people, but by that stage no one took them too seriously. The police did detain and interrogate for low level information. Vince from Art Deco said that when we were travelling to Budapest, there was almost certainly a police informer among the group of people parting with us on that bus. It's not only the materials or sounds of a location that can be useful and expressive. Its histories interact with and enhance the history of the group's site-specific engagements, even if these come to light long after the intervention. Here it's important to remember an older meaning of engagement that predates its use in so-called international art speak. What's relevant here is the martial sense. Engagement not just with a difficult or even hostile location, but with those forces who dictated its histories. Modern historical precedents for their work, such as constructivism, are well known, but there are other far older connections. In their early years, the decaying industry of Deptford was a key source of material and bleak inspiration. Yet besides its industrial history, 
the area has a strategic political one. The old Deptford Bridge was the site of two highly significant struggles. In 1381, Wat Tyler led his rebels into London across it. It was also here that in 1497 Cornish rebels, led by a figure known as Anne Gough, battled an overwhelming royal force that had originally been intended to fight in Scotland. So the group gathered their sonic arsenal and began their campaign in a historic battlefield area strongly associated with the struggle against English royal power. Like so many others, these uprisings were crushed, but remain in the historical record, despite the indifference or hostility of councils. They form part of an alternate lineage of resistance movements, when the powers that be met defiant opposition. Our finest hour at Expo 86 was a suicidal career move when it came to any hope of future arts funding. But it was an opportunity not to be missed, having the eyes of the world on us for Britain Day, especially knowing that Thatcher herself would be visiting the Expo site that day. We had a scary phone call from the Central Office of Information in London just before travelling, warning us not to torpedo the old country now. On the plane to Vancouver, I sketched a stage set inspired by the poster for Battleship Potemkin. As if by fate, the local scrapyards were full of old ships. With the organisers' help, we hijacked the British military band from the Lancashire Regiment, who had no idea they were marching straight into the beginning of our show as part of a fake flag raising ceremony. This featured the Expo flag being taken down and our MOP logo being raised at the entrance to the arena. Our Britain Day show began, thrashing out angry rhythms on rusty gun turrets with sledgehammers to images of Thatcher's Falklands Victory Parade with idiotic crowds waving Union Jacks, intercut with Maggie's beaming face. So please come. There was a barrage of tabloid headlines celebrating the sinking of the Belgrano. Argy bargy, up your junta. Classified film footage of British missile testing was used, with film footage from Malcolm Pointer, another ex-Goldsmith student, whose horsemen of the apocalypse sculptures were seen ushering in the end of the British Empire. Cut up newsreel footage of mounted police charging the enemy within at Orgreave. A black British bugler, Jean Scotty Muir, who'd recently left the army due to institutional racism and striking minor Alan Sutcliffe, wrapped naked in a blanket, reciting Bobby Sands' hunger strike poem, I Fought a Monster Today. In the light of this history, and their 1987 cooperation with another defiant Celtic force, Brief Goth, Tastept appear as inheritors and protagonists of this lasting legacy. Gododin was staged in the already doomed former Rover car factory outside Cardiff. The vast space was erased not long after the project temporarily resurrected it for a final battle. This symbolically connected two narratives the Thatcherite state was keen to downplay or erase, the Celtic and the Industrial. Their powerful mode of transgressive weaponized monumentalism tried to compete with and even to overshadow actual state and corporate rituals. From the mid-80s they increasingly worked with orchestral and choral elements, augmenting their sonic power, and just as their work was orchestrated, they orchestrated the sites that they occupied. The buildings needed to be played and sonically reanimated in a convincing way that left no room for doubt about the group's efficiency. The sounds were not only monumental, but could function as sonic monuments in themselves. They unnerved the state because they looked and sounded like they meant business, and being able to produce convincing work in this type of space was a key part of that. 
It was also unnerving and challenging because it could compete aesthetically and symbolically, partly by using the neo-imperialist symbolism of the Thatcherite state. Examples of this include the use of a military band at Expo 86, the use of Falklands war footage, as seen in their TV collaboration with Steve Martland, and the use of mass drummers and pipers, a technique that reached a climax in Glasgow in 1990. Their monumentalism could and can continue to have powerful effects, disrupting the symbolic order, compelling audiences to reconsider their stances, and perhaps inspiring future struggles. Perhaps it is possible to accept that monumentalism from below, while not a virtue in itself, can definitely have virtuous effects. Like Fisher, Testep tried to map and to combat what they called the sweet sedation of the market. Now, in an era of industrial scale, algorithmic self-sedation. The repressed demand for means to cast off sedation continues to seep through cultural and media filtering systems. There is a hunger for what the group now call industrial agitation. One issue we're currently confronted by is the overproduction of bloodless, nostalgist simulacra of 1980s styles such as industrial music. They stand out not just as historical pioneers, but also because even their newest work remains full-blooded, fueled by sweat and toil. This trace of the real makes it stand out, but, just as in the 80s, also guarantees that it will be partly overlooked. Total State Machine, which Fisher discussed, was self-authorised and self-built, and released by an independent publisher. It didn't go through the usual channels, and even if it had been allowed through, could not have done so without some degree of tempering or decontamination to make it more palatable. Yet the price of refusing to make the usual compromises can be isolation. The Assembly of Disturbance, 2017, London. Test Step returned to the capital, inviting an assemblage of collaborators to engage the popular imagination in spectacular involvement. Antipathy countered by the tactile, a catalyst of noise, infiltrating the airwaves with raw static, an act of disturbance to combat a state of mediocrity, a screaming voice in the face of apathy united in an alliance of rhythmic communication against the disintegration of the social into a perpetually tracked and monitored culture, looking to the revolutionary base of the senses, resounding profusely in the body. A greater musical collectivity, searching its deepest resonance, the senses re-engaged in a resistance to the retreat into the straitjacket of the secure. Following their Expo 86 action, which no British publication ever reported on, and which I wasn't aware of until I began work on the book, the group noticed 
that British coverage of them dried up for some time. The situation now isn't radically different. What limited coverage their activities have received has been in a narrow range of alternative outlets such as Fact or The Quietus, and one isolated appearance on Radio 3. Beyond the existence of the book, which was scarcely reviewed, they remain peripheral and beyond the confines of music and subcultural history, and not really canonical. Besides the collaboration with AV Festival and Gateshead, their only other artistic presence in recent years was in a Leipzig exhibition space run by former East German underground activists. They remain largely beyond the pale of the wider art establishment, even those parts of it that claim to be supporters of radical causes. A statement of Fisher's gives some clues as to why this might be. In 2016, he lamented, there's almost a deliberate removal of effect in many pieces of contemporary art now. What makes it art is that you don't feel anything in relation to it. We're encouraged to feel that we're Neanderthals if we still think that art should create feelings and effects, but it should have aesthetic texture, content, etc. That's not sophisticated. Lots of tendencies in the contemporary art world are exactly against those things. But I'm happy to be a Neanderthal if that's the case. This artistic holding back operates in negative synergy with the exhaustion of the future that Fisher diagnosed, along with its associated depressive, inhibiting effects. Given the state of things, depressive nihilism and fatalism are tempting options for many. Knowledge of the apparent exhaustion of the future can itself be exhausting. In these conditions, the lure of a romantic decline and affecting nostalgia can be very seductive. Yet rather than fetishising it, should we perhaps try to work through the exhaustion, as the group once did for hour after hour in a Dickensian New Cross basement? If you want a paradigmatic example of art and music that refused to collaborate in this removal of effect, even before effectlessness became an orthodoxy, test apps would surely be it. Sound man Jack Balkin remembers how seeing an action, quote, broke through a depressed core in me. This is an example of the galvanising effects produced by working through the exhaustion. Perhaps hope needs to be worked for and at, to be produced and reproduced by constant rehearsal, repetition and exercise, mental as well as physical, or through metaphorical or literal drilling. Could this be one way to reforge or regalvanise new futures? even when the concept of utopia has been extensively privatised and trivialised. The shockwaves of post-imperial collapse, which both Fisher and Testat anticipated, are finally reaching the archaic Westminster structure, and the survival of the current state order is openly questioned. Besides a proliferation of ruins, we'll face a proliferation of debris of all sorts. Once again, Entire industries may be scrapped, and entire districts may experience the type of devastation that inner cities and industrial areas did in the 1980s. Even the most recently gentrified parts of the cities may be much more vulnerable than they imagined to the scale of destruction. Massive sedation and disinformation will be deployed to shore up the facade, but how well can these work when rather than a slow, insidious cancellation of the future that Fisher described, individuals are faced with the brutal overnight cancellation of their futures. There may be no alternative but to forage amidst the literal metaphorical wreckage, gathering scrap, testing it out, 
and seeing how it can be made to resonate and to agitate. 21st century fuel to fight may yet be found amongst the falling masonry and toxic waste of actually existing British democracy.